During this season of Lent, we are reading from the Gospel of Luke. Our text this morning is the story of the prodigal son, one of the most well-known parables Jesus tells. Parables, by the way, are imaginative immersions into God's world. The purpose of these stories Jesus tells us is less to teach us something and more to do something to us. Amy Jill Levine, a Jewish scholar of the New Testament, tells us that if we ever hear a parable and think, I really like that, or worse, fail to hear any challenge in it at all, we are probably not listening deeply enough. Given that perspective, I invite you to enter this story, to inhabit it, to immerse yourself imaginatively into the world of the gospel, the one we encounter in the 15th chapter of Luke, verses 1 and 2 and 11 to 32. Listen for the living word of God. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. This younger son would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and spare? But here I am, dying. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. And the servant replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet. You have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes? You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. He 
Here ends the reading. This is the good news. I'm still learning the microphone system here. Keith, I didn't even realize that the microphone was not on because your voice carries so well. Thank you for that. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, Use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Can you put yourself in his shoes? He has two sons he loves very much. He worked hard all his life to provide for them. He owns large tracts of land and large herds of animals. His fields of crops are tended by many servants. His expansive household flourished, and he is a respected member of the community. One day, his two sons would inherit the farm, carry on his name, and care for him in his old age. Or so he thinks. Until one day, his younger son comes to him and asks to receive his share of the wealth now. Actually, he doesn't ask, he demands it right now. What this boy doesn't say, but what the father has surely heard, is I don't care if you are alive or dead. I don't want to be part of this family anymore. Just give me what's mine and let me go. And he did. He gave it to him, and with this bundle of cash, the boy ran away. He left for another country, and he never wrote home. When he left, a large part of the father's heart went with him. His heart was broken, and perhaps he was angry, too. After a lifetime of caring for this child, keeping him safe and warm, giving him shelter and food, teaching him right from wrong, and loving him every day of his life, all this son has to say is, give me now what you owe me. In the midst of all that entitlement, where was the gratitude? The father may have been mad, but mostly... He was in mourning, full of sorrow, that it had come to this, and there was nothing he could do about it. He missed his son. Can you put yourself in his shoes? His belly is empty, his body is filthy. His fine clothes are reduced to rags. He has no shoes left for you to put yourself in. He has cut himself off from his father, his brother, his community. He hadn't left home to seek his fortune. He had left to squander it, to live wildly and to waste it, and now he has nothing to show for it. He had traded his birthright for a bag of coins and brought disgrace on himself and his family. He is tired and hungry, lost and utterly alone. There is no shoulder to lean on, no friend to call, no charitable stranger he could beg for help. When he realizes the pigs he is feeding are better off than he is, he swallows his pride. Aware of all the bad decisions he'd made and the swine he'd kept company with and the hurt he had inflicted on the people who had loved him, 
he turns and trudges back up the road. Sonship he can no longer expect from his father, but maybe his father would permit him to be one of the hired hands. He has no idea that his father has been waiting for him to return. No idea the old man has been every day scanning the horizon, watching for some speck in the distance that might signal the wanderer's return. And now, while he is still far off from the house, he can see a figure running towards him, running. When it dawns on him that it's his father, he's not sure what to think. Was the old man coming out to stop him from getting any closer? Was he planning to turn him away? According to the customs of the day, the father would have been fully within his rights to disown him. As the old man draws near, he readies his well-rehearsed speech. There are some who have doubted the sincerity of this younger son, but as he comes close, his confession begins to pour out. I have sinned against God. I have sinned before you. I don't deserve to be your son. But these words of his, they fall on deaf ears. The father never hears them. He doesn't need to hear them. And now the old man is talking too. He is shouting actually, but not to scold his son. He is issuing instructions to the servants. Bring the best robe, he bellows. Bring the family ring for his finger and shoes for his feet. Barbecue the beef and invite the whole town. And then arms reach out to catch this child. They open wide and wrap around him. And as the young son falls into them, he can feel the old man's heart pounding. The father holds him and hugs him and kisses him and welcomes him home. Can you put yourself in his shoes? He is the eldest son, the dutiful one who stayed at home. He toiled in the fields, tended the animals, balanced the books. He followed all the rules and he knew his place. He stood by his father through the humiliating departure of his younger brother and he would serve his father while his father lived and he would receive his share of the fields and the livestock and the household. He would do all the things a responsible son does and earn his reward. But when he sees that his younger brother is greeted with a hero's welcome rather than a rascal's reprimand, it is more than he can bear. He stands in the shadows, sulks from a distance, and watches the party from afar. When it dawns on the father that the one who is lost now is the one who never left home, he does not wait for him to show up. He goes out to look for this lost sheep. When his father finds him, this elder boy cannot hide his resentment, his confusion, his hurt. This son of yours, not this brother of mine, this son of yours, you throw a big party for the whole neighborhood, but you have never even given me a pot roast to share with my friends. For all the differences between their stories, the two brothers are in agreement. I have sinned and I am not worthy, says the younger. You deserve the ditch you landed in, and I deserve what will come to me, says the older. So they see it the same way. But here's where they miss the point, and here's where the father gets it. This is not a story 
about what we deserve and how worthy we are. This is not about a love we have to negotiate or earn to receive. It's a story about grace. Unmerited, unearned, unfathomable. It is about a love that is lavish, a love that is prodigal, profligate, extravagant, reckless, it is also a love that is absolutely steadfast. As the father reminds the sons, the reward, the approval, the blessing, the ones you seek, they are already yours, and they have always been yours. No matter whose shoes we wear, the holy ground we are standing on is this. We are loved not because we are responsible or reverent or righteous, but simply because we are gods. So yes, this is a story about God's great love for us. A God who loves us without limits or constraints, a God who loves us beyond all reason. But that's not all. And we are indebted to Amy Jill Levine for pointing out that there are exhortations we can draw from this familiar story that are profound and challenging and that also have the potential to change our relationships. First of all, she says, recognize that the one who is lost may be in your very own household. Do whatever it takes to find the lost and then celebrate, both so you don't miss the joy and so that there's less chance of them becoming lost again. Be like the Father and don't wait until you receive an apology. You may never get one. Don't wait until you can muster the ability to forgive. You may never find it. Don't stew in your own sense of being ignored, for there is nothing that can retrieve the past. Instead, go have lunch, she says. <laughs> go celebrate and invite others to join you. If the real repenting and the forgiveness come at this time, so much the better. If not, you will have done what is necessary to begin the process that might lead to reconciliation, to the lost being found, to the dead coming back to life. Most of all, more than anything else, don't miss the joy. And I would add, don't miss the gospel truth that remains the same and does not change. God loves you not because you have earned it or because of your striving. God loves you because she can't help it, because that's just who God is. Amen. <laughs>